Uh, and uh, this one goes to the two of you from Adore Khalil Jibat. Uh, he's asking, they're asking, if you were given a second chance to be born again, <laughs> would you choose Kenya and Uganda respectively? Uh, that's Adore Jibat, a book lover from Kenya. If you were given a, chance, a second chance to be born again, would you choose Kenya and Uganda respectively? Um, <laughs> that's interesting. I, one of the things I am aware of, and I'm one of those people, and I suspect most authors are probably like me, we feel a little bit too much. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's a burden. But one of the things I'm so aware of is how I did not have a choice in who I am, mm. you know? Um, and again, it, that all happened when I came out here. And I realized I did not have a choice in being born Ugandan, a Muganda, a woman. I did not have a choice to being born to my parents. And I'm aware that my son did not have a choice to being born to me. And I think there's an, an, an incredible aware uh, unfairness, that probably the worst unfairness or nature in terms of that. And so it becomes a little difficult for me to contemplate choosing a place mm -hmm. to be born in, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. I know it, it's something you're asking nature to do something that will never happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so will I choose to be born elsewhere? Um, I don't care, really. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't care where I would be born, as long as I'm born with a brain. <laughs> <laughs> and, yes. and the ability to make the most out of my life. Mm -hmm. the, the, life is such a tragedy that it, to talk about whether to choose where to be born is like talking about whether to choose when to die, where to die, you know? <laughs> Those subjects that are so out there uh, that yeah. I, as a writer, because as a writer, I know I give myself some good like powers and I do A, B, C, D with characters, kill people, put people here. To, but when I put myself in that position as the character, I realize how weak and hopeless I am and I don't. <laughs> Thank you. No, um, wow. Uh, you know, I think I, as much as I was, you know, decrying the idea of, of nation, um, I, I love, I, I, let me repeat it, I love belonging to the geography of East Africa. Um, I am I am East African primarily. I, I love the geographies. I love our, our 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 peoples. I also lay claim to the sea. I'd have loved to be born uh, under the sea, over the sea, wherever. Um, if 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 I could, I I I I, I greet life as uh, life is an adventure. Life is a mystery. Um, life is is strange. Life is uh, gorgeous. Life is uh, fierce. Life is terrible. Life is all these things, and 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 the, I find it a great privilege to uh, have been born into life, uh, into the earth. Um, I would take whatever and wherever. I, um, if there was a kind of reincarnation, uh, wherever I, I, I would take wherever I was placed. I would. And if, if I had a say in where I was to be placed, I would uh, I would log in for Kenya uh, again, but insist that um, it's an East African kind of specter. <laughs> mm. I think that's where we, we, we for the first time we, you know, we like, <laughs> like hey, everyone. Uh, because as much as I'm very, very proud to be Ugandan and I'm Ganda, and I, I can't be more proud I am aware that had I been born in Fuji, I would have loved yes. it as much as I love Uganda. Being, being a Ugandan, yes, wherever, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, again, that it comes out of having traveled and realizing that, the, that uh, life is a lottery. Mm -hmm. 
and being born as a lottery. And so I, wow. uh, for me, yes, wherever I would be born, I, mm. I would make the most of it. But, and, and this is where me and Yvonne, we, we, we divert. Mm. I, um, I don't think being born was a privilege. Really? I mean, you no, know, okay. I think I've not, really? not have lived mm. and I would not have cared. I, I've always been so aware of that. Perhaps just knowing that I'm just like a leaf falling off a tree. Um, and, yeah. you know, the way I am aware that, uh, yes, I'm trying very much to make life, uh, leave, leave the world better than I found it. But mm -hmm. I am so tiny. You know, Yvonne, you're so aware <laughs> of how tiny, how inconsequential you are. Yes, I, I think it's that's part of the delight. It's <laughs> part of the pleasure of it. I, I, I love that. I love that. I love that. I love that. I, I love that realm of the. Um, you know, it's I, I find I, the pleasure I find in the inconsequential nature, the the smallness that we really are. Yes. I place it next to the hubris of our of our newspaper and news headlines that that centers how fabulous we are because we're going to mars and i keep thinking <laughs> are you I mean, like me about yes, uh, i find it i it it, it gives me a, a, a maybe it's, maybe it's a macabre glee a, a macabre pleasure you know you know that you know that roman exhortation remember that you shall die <laughs> this too shall pass oh is it a persian saying this too shall pass <laughs> It's lovely talking to you because you are pessimistic <laughs> as I am pessimistic. <laughs> I absolutely love it. I think it's working well together, you know. It's a, it's a good balance, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and when you talked about the sea, and uh, one of the questions I've always heard about, you know, your writing is just like we talked about Kenya and, you know, um, I wonder if there's a particular place in Kenya that, and this is also for you, Jennifer, you know, when you're in Uganda, um, a particular place that, or landscape that speaks to your imagination, that kind of pulls your stories from their hiding places. You know, is there a particular place or, mm. you know, landscape that does that to you when you're there, you just feel like mm. alive and ready to create. Um, mm. I don't know about Yvonne, but mm. I've gone to, I've got to a place, I think, and this is about growing up and aging, where I'm just looking for mm. the little Jennifer that I was, you know, 10, mm. 12, 14, 15, 18, and how mm. the world seemed so big, you know, yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the valleys were deeper. Mm. And so uh, when I remember my childhood and all these villages that I write about, whether it's Nateta mm. or whether it's Wobblers, because those are all spaces where my parents come from, mm -hmm. I go back to do research and I'm like, but that valley was deeper than that. <laughs> <laughs> And I go to a hill and I'm like, but this hill I used to see so deep, so further. Of course, the, the, the landscape is changing because of building in terms of, you know, a high rise building, all of that is changing. But I think for me, the place is childhood. Mm. It's, oh, beautiful. It's that, mm. it, I am, I'm discovering and I don't know why, but I'm, I'm keep, I keep going back and looking for the places that I saw as a child. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as a child, you know, when I was working with my dad, my dad was six foot and mm -hmm. I was very tiny here. And I would walk with him, jumping up and down, catching up with him and therefore seeing the world from that very tiny, <laughs> that is where I tend to go and see that world. And this is why then I tend to write historical fiction. Mm -hmm. Mm. because then it allows me to go back to that world when I was a child. So yes, as soon as I land in Kampala, 
-hmm. You know, as soon as I get on a pl off the plane and the heat hits me and I hear loud noises, people talking, and then I see <clears throat> the body language, the way we walk. And yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's a, a rhythm of the way we use language, whether it's English or Uganda, and it could be dust, it could be the annoying border border, all of that. Just, um, but also seeing that everybody outside me is black. You yeah. just go, <laughs> someone who is like this, you just go, who? <laughs> and you're looking around like, do you have you noticed the world, how brilliant the world is? And they're looking at you. Well, what, what is she excited about? <laughs> <laughs> it's that moment. And, and then I start to speak my language. And then uh, language. All, all, all the gestures that I miss, you know. Uh, I, I, and, and, you know, yeah. You know, all of that just takes me back. And, um, and I'm like, yeah, this is where I should be if I'm writing. Mm. Uh uh, -huh. <laughs> uh in answer to that question i'm a bit promiscuous and adulterous in my relationships <laughs> with uh, uh with landscapes um and and each one wherever it is even if it's in um uh, what do you call it even if it's the atlantic ocean um gestures or provides or, or enters into an interesting kind of conversation with my artistic muse or spirit or whatever it is. Uh, the Lewis call it juogi, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and for me, no story comes unless um, stories appear, come to me when I enter into, uh, a, a, you know, a, 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 a space, a story can, a story shows up just literally out of nowhere from the most surprising of landscapes. So um, I, I, I treasure everyone, but every single one that I meet. But having said that, uh, when I was about six or seven, uh, my parents took us to the coast, Mombasa, mm -hmm. near Nyali. And uh, it was my first glimpse of the sea, of the ocean. How was that? Oh, my dear. I had never seen anything more tremendous more beautiful more overwhelming at high tide i still remember the the tide was coming in and the and the blue it was a blue i'd never imagined i think in in that little age i ever imagined existing and it came with such force such power and such beauty i've never seen anything more transcending you know the thing that takes you out of yourself uh, something that took me out of my little my little self and it meant it means that even when I live in Nairobi, I live haunted by the sea. I live my Nairobi is uh, characterized by, among other things, a longing for the ocean, a longing for the sea. Uh, when I'm far from from water, I something in me knows that I'm very far. I'm very far. It's not about rivers. It, it, I'm very far from the sea. Um, I can smell the sea maybe a hundred kilometers before the sea appears. So. <laughs> And I think I'm a better human being uh, around the sea. I'm a much better mm -hmm. human being around the ocean. So there, there is that too. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 perhaps I should add that there's something about rain for uh, me. Yes. Uh, it's because you talked about the sea that I remembered. Yes. But it's also, rain out here doesn't do it. It's the <laughs> thunderstorm, you know? Uh -huh. Rain here is so lazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it falls without it, you, it, rain that would fall in 30 minutes in Uganda. <laughs> days out here. <laughs> but, but That's I beautiful. Think, but it's the drama, the yeah. drama of rain in Uganda. Yeah. What well, it, it first it blows the wind, you scum and you're like, <laughs> As a child, I would get ooh, excited you know, the minute the wind started to blow. And then there's that thing, you know, when if you're going to bed and suddenly the wind start to blow outside and if you're in a complicated iron house and that noise and how you burrow into your bed and you're like, ooh, <laughs> as I told you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. My childhood. yeah. But uh, it's th this magic about rain for me that yeah. I can 
explain that I tried to write in my book and probably failed. But I, once Yvonne talked about the sea, I remembered rain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you. Uh, it's about to rain where I am, by the way. So I'm yeah, going. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, Kiprop Kimutai uh, from. Uh, from Nairobi, I don't know if Kiprop is in Nairobi. Uh, Kiprop is asking, Yvonne, what, what do we do about our complicated emotions with our countries? How do mm. we imagine beyond Nimetoka na Kenya, I'm tired of Kenya, mm. and let's vote mm. wisely. How do we imagine beyond that? You know, th th you know Kiprop, thank you for that question. Um, do you know... <laughs> How where do I, it, it's it's a question that's so deeply uh, entrenched in my own spirit. Mm -hmm. We have to because we keep hearing how terrible and bad we are, and our media and our story makers are very much a part of that narration. It's almost a hypnotic narration, right? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it's hypnotic and, and it's as if that's the only kind of story that we, that's the only way we can recognize and see ourselves. Mm -hmm. It means then that the grammar and the language of, 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 of love, of loving ourselves, of loving the place um, is, is completely marginalized or amputated. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the erotic sense of, 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 of our belonging gets lost. Others do it so well. Americans overdo it with their narrative of exceptionalism, uh, or et cetera, et cetera. The John Wayne, Marlboro Man, et cetera, et cetera thing. Um, I, I'm not saying we necessarily need to go that way, but it, it's, it's probably an act of revolution to dare to find the language of, 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 of our love. Um, and within that, it's, it's, it does not mean that we, we will neglect um, the darkness, the shadows, the, the pain. Um, it, it, it's merely, it, might, it, might, it will probably act as a, a window, a door and a way of consuming, consuming that, the, the darkness. Uh, love always does seem to consume the darkness, but that is the harder work. That is the hardest work. It's easier to, it's easier to sink into the darkness and disappear mm -hmm. uh, than to howl at the skies to open up and, and, and bring, bring the light in. Uh, it's hard work. It's such hard work. And I do not, I do not believe we have gotten there yet. I do not think we've ever done it yet. Yeah. And, and I, I hope that we'll have the courage to tell the noise makers, the, the ones who have imposed themselves as protagonists of our national stories, of, of our social histories, to shut the F up. Mm -hmm. They are so un uninteresting and they produce absolutely nothing that brings life. Yeah. Um, but we won't because we, we, we also, we, we may not do it yet because we are also enthralled by the soap opera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. We really are enthralled by that. And how do we, do we, is it in the way we write about ourselves, the way we report about ourselves in the news? Like how, how do we move towards, uh, you know, that, um, I like this, what you say, language of loving ourselves, you know, how do we reinvent this language? Is it in the way we talk about ourselves and write about ourselves? Mm -hmm. uh, if I were to answer that, I don't know how Jennifer would answer it, but I would, uh, pick, 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 and pick any one of. I'm t speaking of the Kenyan speak space, mm. and I remember the similar kind of narrative sense in the uh, uh, Abuja newspapers. And I keep thinking, is this a plan? Is this intended? How can how can the same mediocre negating narrative inform mm. the headlines of all our nations? Mm. Um, I'm not saying that we ignore, like I said, we do, it's not about ignoring the shadows as much as creating also space um, for, for that which gives life, for our excellence. You've noticed how, uh, especially in the West, how even if, they are, uh, even if they are dying, look at the Texas situation, they will always make a point of, of, of generating at least seven different heroes or heroines that affirm the, the deepest and highest ideal and ideal of, of who they think and, and know they are. So you, you, have, you have the January 6th episode in Capitol, 
in, in the capital, what do you call it? Uh, uh, in their capital, yes. But you, we, we all know the name uh, Goodman, Elijah Goodman, and all these other heroes. They always make a point of, of uh, affirming themselves, even when they're in the, in the heart of the abyss. Um, we don't. Uh, in terms of what language should we use, I, I think because journalism in its nature, the way we use it now, is mm. something that we picked from the West. Yeah. We are echoing the way they wrote about us right from the start. Ah, yes. That's very true. So we are, for some reason, we are always going to do what they've done about us. They are, they, it's somehow we imagine that this is the only way. You, mm -hmm. We will have to take a, a very uh, aware decision to say, okay, we are going to stop writing the way the West does someone yeah. will come out, uh, out and say this is the way i write about africa this is the way i write about my country but mm -hmm. to go back to uh how do we look at, uh, at ourselves in terms of looking at ourselves in uh, positively for me i think that happened when i was writing chinton mm, the minute i put down the the time scale of civilization, where the West took 2000 years to get where they are. Mm -hmm. And I looked at what point did they bring their civilization to us and where we are now with it. And in relation to who we were uh, and then taking on something that wasn't a natural to us, I think we are doing pretty well. Mm. You know, because if you look at Western history, um, 2,000 years of savagery, of <laughs> poverty, of serfdom, of, of, I mean, they were so bad we haven't got to where they are, <laughs> they were before. Yes. So someone comes to, the, uh, to Africa, we are developing in a particular direction and they redirect us in their direction. And for some reason, we Africans imagine that within 50 years, we should be like America. I mean, how do we imagine we are superhuman? Look at the Americans. Mm -hmm. They left Europe with already the, the culture, the politics, the food, everything. And they still for 2,200 years or more, they still are, they were struggling, you know? We have only done this 50 years, 60 years, mm -hmm. and we are doing something that is unnatural to us because mm -hmm. at the core of it, we're African. Yes. But a parts of us are doing Western, European. This is why, for example, in politics, people will come and say, I'm going to be a president. But naturally, they turn out to be chiefs. They mm -hmm. can't help that. And for me, I believe that whatever we are going through is a natural process, a result of what has been done to us. Mm -hmm. But every, mm -hmm. every year, every generation, we are improving on it. It's not going to take us 2,000 years, mm -hmm. I can tell you that, you know. So uh, mm -hmm. I can look at mm -hmm. what people say and say, okay, be impatient with yourself, but you're not going anywhere quickly because mm -hmm. you are making something new. We are not going to be uh, European, but we are no longer going to be what our, our ancestors were. We are creating something new in Africa. It's going to happen. I don't know when, mm -hmm. but we, we could, as you, Yvonne mm -hmm. says, we could love ourselves sometimes. I, unfortunately, the nature of my job, I'm not going to do that, but perhaps <laughs> <laughs> someone, someone <laughs> should do it, but I am not, I, I, I am not, and again, it's until I came out of, Brit of Uganda. I mm. am not disillusioned by Uganda. I am mm. uh, so mm. proud of what Ugandans have achieved in spite. Because for me, all the development mm. that I see in Uganda, this is all a result of the little tiny man who works in the market, the one who wakes up in the morning and does this, these people are building the nation despite the politicians. Mm -hmm. And I think 
You know what? I am ridiculously <laughs> proud of it. It's just that I'm not going to tell them. That's all. <laughs> 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 I, I just it, uh, just to, just to add a little bit more um uh, yeah, the, it, it you know the idea of the, the the idea of this we are storying ourselves anyway we are creating the story of of, of who we are in the, in the place that is happening yeah. anyway i'm curious about i'm very very profoundly interested in what asia has done um and specific countries um south korea given that they were so completely devastated i think in the 60s we were even kenya was even lending money to south korea but the the will when when they decided uh, i think about uh, 30 years ago to focus on what they actually had which was themselves Mm. And then to elevate the sense of self in story, in music, in, in particularly film. That's why the, the, the drama basically has taken over the world right now. But it was it was um, done in a way, if we talk about the, the power of story, but it's also done in a way in which um, that which is loved and lovable um, gets portrayed primarily for themselves. And, and that seems to that energy seems to feed a whole lot of other things. Um, the, you, you know, informs new technologies, informs new ideas, or new ways of interacting and relating. Um, I actually think, and I'm glad the the trend, the the, the epoch, our, even even the African epoch, the the African glance is split into one eye looks westward, but the other eye uh, actually into three. One is within, and the other is actually firmly looking towards. Um, our, via our seas looking to Asia and the Middle East, because I think the examples of, of what a nation can do once it decides to fall in love with itself um, and, and then language that love without, without ignoring its wounds. Um, I mean, it's in, impressive what, 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 what a, a nation can do with that. China, to take the example of China. I was reading, I found an old newspaper in the archives, I think in 1973, just Kenya was sending them, don sending donations of tea to China. It, it, it's, it's ironic, yes, because tea comes from China, but send, Kenya was sending donations, right? <laughs> but, but look at the world, look at them where right now, yeah. yeah. But again, it's one of those things that involves major, major hard, hard work and a critical capacity to look at ourselves, look within. Um, to to not be afraid of our own shadows, our own failures, uh, but then use that as a reason to find a new way um, to write another another story of ourselves. Yeah, and and I, I love what you say, happened. like languaging it. Uh, languaging it. Y yes. Yvonne, I think it's beginning to happen in Africa, mm -hmm. and perhaps this mm -hmm. is because I'm from without, and people that are within the thing don't realize mm -hmm. the thing. Mm -hmm. This Afrocentric spirit is picking up in Africa, at least from what I see. And mm. there's, there's conversation because of social media between a Ugandan and a Zambian and a Nigerian and whatever. And mm. it's, it's at cultural levels, whether it's at the musicians, you know, mm. whether it's mm. fashion. Okay, but I think, and the consumption of that culture, okay? And they pick, it's also picking up in terms of consumption of our writing. Oh, yes, yes, yeah, okay. The markets are picking up. Now my publishers are starting to think about when they publish, they, mm -hmm. they think about, okay, when are you launching in Uganda, where, where, in East Africa? And when I'm watching in Nigeria, they are so aware. Uh, I am telling you of the book reader mm. in Nigeria. So mm. it's picking up and uh, and I, you can't see it because you're in it when you're in Africa. Yeah, perfect. But, so I need distance. So when, distance. <laughs> let me tell you, I walk into, I, sometimes I walk into a, a store mm -hmm. like uh, Max and Spencer. Mm -hmm. And they're playing Nigerian music, man. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I stop and look around to see whether, you know, sometimes you don't even realize you're starting to go and my husband saying, ah, that, that talks to you. I say, yeah, it's Nigerian music. <laughs> but uh, there's a way that Africa has started to have conversation with itself. Yeah, necessary. Overdue, long, long overdue.
Yeah. yeah, and Africa is saying to the West, you know what? Forget who you were. This is for us. And and it's picking up. And and there are so many programs I watch on CNN, um, you know, African changers. People are watching these programs. It is in Zimbabwe, it is in Nigeria, it is in um, Namibia. And someone in Uganda is seeing what other Africans are doing. And they are picking up ideas. And, and I think this is a renaissance for me, whether it's in arts, whether it's in, uh, uh, in terms of culture consumption, like food, it, it, Yvonne, it's happening and it's happening in our time. And mm -hmm. it's happening when we are writing, you know? And I think, <laughs> and I think it's wonderful, but mm. people are just not aware. Yeah, interesting. Oh, the, her, the rain must have reached her. <laughs> <laughs> Should we look at the chat and look for questions there? Yes, look at the question. Yes, yes. Uh, while we wait for Dinda. Okay. Uh, There's Adrienne Rich. Do you see Adrienne? Okay. Yes. Okay. What does it say? Adrienne Rich writes that a dream of tenderness wrestles with all I know of history. Both of your books do not shy from and often actively engage the violence of history and the violence of personal histories. What practices- Oh, she's back. <laughs> huh? What practices um, you help you imagine otherwise than the trajectories that continually endanger life and deny other ways of being. Can you go, Yvonne? Because I read it. Okay. You. <laughs> very, very. Okay. Both of your books do not. Uh, what practices help you imagine otherwise? I, I don't know if one can say there's one particular practice that uh, invites an, an imagination, both of tenderness, of gentleness, of love, um, and, and to uh, contend with uh, the, a story of humanity that says that we must kill one another in order to progress. Um, but it is, I, I think, it, it, you know, the, the the worlds of the arts deliver uh, yeah, all, all sorts of possibilities. All the 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 encounters with spiritualities and 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 other other cultures, other ways of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the histories of other cultures and how they related with the world. Um, uh, what other practices would be, or uh, you know, engage? I I I'm, I I am I'm, 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 I've entered maybe far too deeply into the philosophies and and thoughts of the mostly the south americans like kihano or um, uh, uh, mignolo who speak of uh, pluriversality who speak of of, of other kinds of uh, philosophical orientations uh, for engaging the world and which will absolutely show up in some of my literature um, so um there's a i think there's a smorgasbord of possibilities in, in the world um I think the other practice is to treat a lot of the press, a lot of, it's very interesting. I don't know if it's happening to some of you. Uh, automatically now, when I read uh, a, a newspaper or uh, I, I, I hear news that comes from the West, my next and immediate reaction is to say, um, okay, now that I've heard this, what is the actual story? <laughs> Indeed, but it's automatic because yeah. So uh, so yeah, to find to find new sources from other spaces, I think there's a whole other thing. Yeah. Mm. Uh, for me, rather than deal with practices, um, because Yvonne has dealt with that quite fantastically, I'd like to talk about uh, three facts about violence that mm -hmm. I normally would advise Black and African readers to be aware of. Mm -hmm. You know, violence mm -hmm. as a fact of life. That's mm -hmm. one aspect. And then violence as being erased from literature, especially Western literature, where people mm -hmm. say, oh, 
oh, that is so violent as if it's non-human. <laughs> And the way the West, <laughs> then, interesting, yes. You know the way the West presents uh, violence. Normally, when somebody is violent, for example, let's take Idi Amin, he loses his humanity. Okay. Yes. And he becomes a yes. monster. But right. Or a beast. But think about it. Have you seen an animal <laughs> behave towards each other in terms of violence? without reason, like the way that. we humans engage in violence. Way. With animals, yeah. it's territory, Make it's messing, it's about, it's about existence. It's mm. us humans who invade, uh, engage in violence in a particular way. But then Western writing and Western readership are telling you not to engage with violence, which is uniquely very human. And especially a West where you have people who go to schools and just shoot each other. Or where you have mm. people who just kill people for the art of killing because <laughs> they are serious. I'm telling you, this kills me. Yes, when men, yes, this okay. is a West that has a specific genre that deals with violence. You know, the detective stories, they start with the body. You know, with Africa, we don't deal with it. And I would like Africans to consider the fact that violence is racialized. Mm. And this is how it's racialized. So Dan Brown opens the Da Vinci Code <laughs> with the absolute, you know, the garrow of murder. Okay. Chintu opens with an accidental killing of a man. Dan Brown is so acceptable. Mm -hmm. Chintu is not. Okay? You could have an African waving a machete, just waving it. And all readers would, oh my God, the violence. And then you have another book starting with a white person throwing the atomic bomb mm -hmm. on Nagasaki. And that would not be read as violence. So, we, and we have been conditioned ourselves. So whenever you meet violence in African writing, it's, oh my God, when you meet violence in white people's writing, it's art. It's <laughs> epistemic. But I'm telling you, the way you just have to look at these things and say, what is going on? And personally, I've refused to partake in that, in that performance. <laughs> and I, I remember one time I was doing my PhD and we were looking at theory. And I said, I'd like to, this group was just dealing with uh, reading theory. So I said, okay, let's look at, um, Franz Fanon, and the guy who was leading the group said, well, Franz Fanon um, um, claims or suggests or recommends violence for the, you know, the colonial entity to, re to, re to set itself free and we don't subscribe to violence. And at that time, when I was told that America and Britain were going to Iraq, I looked at this bastard, mm -hmm. But I didn't have the language. But what I said to him, do you know what? Nobody eats violence. Do you know the way Africans speak? <laughs> you know, nobody eats violence. <laughs> and I walked away. <laughs> but that's the nature. And remember, because we are writing and being published out here, then violence is being um, erased out of our writing. And we as Africans are are playing along, you know? So this is where even the question comes from, mm. how you're dealing with violence, because as if violence is something set apart, but actually violence is always with us. It's there and we should engage with it. I think violence is put in the same place as sex. Even though everybody engages in every night. 
you know, but you know, oh my God, you wrote about sex stuff. <laughs> I wrote about eating food. Why has no one commented about that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I, I got lost, but therefore I, you know, Nairobi, KPLC, I got disconnected for a minute, but thank you. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. And uh, somebody, Ranka Primorak, is asking, Jennifer, can you please talk about the episodes in The First Woman where the two women protagonists go out in the rain? Oh, I guess this is about the rain that you so passionately described. That's <laughs> happening right now where I am. <laughs> okay. Well, um, what, 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 what would they like me to talk about in terms of so they want you to talk about the episodes in The First Woman where the two women protagonists go out in the rain. Okay. Um, unfortunately, this comes towards the end of the novel and yeah. it's very hard for me to talk about it without making these revelations. But I thought that rain took them back to their childhood. And rain... I look, as they grew up, they had accumulated certain aspects of themselves that w w this accumulation turned into baggages and turned into mm. things that became almost nooses around them. So you know how in Africa, as a young girl, you're not so encumbered, but once you grow up and uh, um, become a woman, we have this say a whole woman to do that or you get married can you believe she's yeah. a married woman but she did that and then you have children oh my god she's even a mother can you imagine and then you have <laughs> grandchildren. she's a grandmother do you did you see how she was dressed all of these things that happen to us become spaces where we are more restricted Okay, and these two women were restricted, even mm. though one of them was fighting uh, as hard as possible. But in this moment of rain, they just went back to that childhood. And when you look at one of them stripping and you see all the clothes, the garments she wears falling, you know, one by one, because all of those garments represent um, as something that has tied her. You know, each garment she gets rid of, she becomes freer. And, and, and so suddenly she flies out of the room absolutely naked. And I wanted people to see through the grandchild how even though she is imagines herself so uh, liberated, how constricted she was in herself, in terms of looking at another woman's nakedness, okay? In terms of looking at another woman, getting rid of all those things that, 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 that were constricting her. And this is why even us women, when we see a fellow woman, you know, trying to shed off those restrictions, we are the first to go for her. Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you believe it? Oh, she's so embarrassing. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. Thank you for that. We have about, uh, I think, nine minutes before, uh, because we want to keep this under two hours. So I'm just going to ask two very quick questions. Uh, one is from, um, from Sando uh, Giovanni. Uh, Sando is asking, does the loss of a country include the inability to the leaving. I'm wondering what leaving means in your works. What does leaving mean? Uh, repeat that, please. Uh, does, repeat the loss, uh, does the loss of a country include the inability to stay? Mm, mm, beautiful. I'm wondering what leaving means in your works. Wow. Um, uh, go on, Yvonne. No, no, I'm, I'm just struck by the beauty of that question. But yes, absolutely. Um, country loss, uh, loss somehow is intertwined with the, with the notion of leaving, even if you do not leave successfully. 
Um, and yeah, that does uh, my, my, the characters in my work. Um, Oh, hello. Oh, I think we lost Yvonne. We've lost Yvonne. Longing yeah. to leave. Um, oh, okay. Partly ad adventure and curiosity. Uh, partly adventure and curiosity, but needing, wanting to leave. N my uh, back, back to back to my Nairobi. Nairobi is the place I'm always trying to leave, but it's the place to which I always, that's always that I always come back to, almost reluctantly and tearfully. Um, and, 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 and with the same kind of longing that, that made me leave it. Um, but yeah, um, I, I, I just love the, the beauty of, of that question as well. And, and, and yes, I, I don't know if one can say anything more. Yes, uh, loss also includes leaving. Um, in my case, uh, leaving wasn't a result of loss of country. I think loss of country comes as a result of living in my writing. And, mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps to, to talk about it personally, rather than from my char character's points of view, um, the, the leaving itself w is more about exploration you know, mm -hmm. um, to see the world, to see what is out there. But loss of country is accidental by staying too long, <laughs> you know, um, and, and then realizing what you're losing and panicking. And mm -hmm. perhaps this question now has uh, made me realize that perhaps I write about country over and over in order to reclaim it in, for myself, in order to mm. belong again, that mm. perhaps unconsciously I'm aware that I'm losing country and I'm not having it and I'm desperately getting it back. Mm. And this is perhaps why I'm not writing about the present, but writing about the past, which I know I cannot lose because I had that country and I carried that country with me. Mm and therefore not being so confident about writing this moment because I am, am, I am not there. But I dare not contemplate as Jennifer, as a Ugandan, as a Muganda, the loss of country. I dare not contemplate that because then as I stand outside my country, then I would lose everything that I've got. Mm. That this is all I have. You know, I dare not lose my country. So it doesn't matter what has just happened uh, recently in terms of election. You know, I always say to people that Britain is like living with your rich cousins. <laughs> Often you need to go back home, you know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, and you leave your mansions behind and all the wonderful uh, things you have. <laughs> top of the hill and go down to in the valley where you belong. And I dare not lose sight of that because the hill doesn't belong to me. So yeah. in a way, I dare not contemplate the loss of country. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And I think that will be our last question. We do have, I think, five more questions we didn't get to, but because of time, I don't think we're going to uh, answer them, but uh, thank you so much, Yvonne and Jennifer. I feel, you know, what a what a what a what an honor to be with you guys and to be in your presence and listen to you guys uh, think together. Um, I feel very nourished. I hope everybody is feeling very nourished. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you have uh, any closing statements, anything you might like to add before we you know, go make dinner or whatever that people yeah. are <laughs> to <do> to <laughs> But any closing statement? Um, uh -huh. Okay, I'll go first. Um, yeah. One, can I thank everybody who's tuned in? And uh, can I thank you, Yvonne, because for some reason having this conversation with you has opened aspects of my mind that I wasn't aware of. So, <laughs> 
I did and likewise. Yeah. And yeah. That, I didn't prepare for this kind of conversation at all. But uh, what I would like to add is that the, the way me, I and Yvonne and other writers, African women writers are, are in this moment looking back in the past rather than going forward, mm -hmm. we are trying to look back in the past at our histories because those voices, those feminine voices and the feminine way of seeing history have been missing. And also that uh, the feminine action and the way we shaped our countries and our nation is, is missing. But that has only been possible because in the 70s, early 60s, there were women trailblazers who took a machete and cut you know, a trail where I and Yvonne are able to go and look at what they've done. They've done mm -hmm. that, they've done that. Okay, I can afford to look back in the past and be part, bring pe women into yes. nation building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for such a gift. Um, mine is uh, to say, yeah. Can you know the you know you know you know the, you know the Kenyan the Kenyan speaker that's given the microphone and says Yangu <laughs> Nib and you know you're in, you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> you might charge it too. <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> anyway, but, but literally it is. It's just simply say thank you, thank you for the nourishing, thank you for uh, the space, the bringing together uh, of, of this possibility. Dinda, Benga, Yinka, Ketchi, each and every single one of you. And the panelists, the amazing panelists, uh, particularly those uh, in a special way from uh, parts of Asia uh, that heard about this and tuned in at once um, to expand our confluential uh, conversations. I, I refer to them only because uh, I, I, want, I want to end with uh, with a notion that uh, new spaces are opening anyway, new new spaces of preferred conversations are unfolding anyway, and I hope that we are um, a awake enough to enter boldly into. Uh, Jennifer spoke about the machetes, the opening up of the spaces by by especially the women who have gone before us. Uh, I hope our, I hope the generations to come, artistic generations, are going to leap into that space and and uh, and own and write write the future it's already happening and it's and we are and it's around and it's around us so i'm just grateful i'm truly grateful to everybody and keep healthy keep covid free <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so much thank you Juan and jennifer and benga and katie and yinka for organizing this you guys are doing some wonderful work amazing you. guys you guys are amazing amazing yeah yeah, yeah.